constitutional order. Michael? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, which, alphabetically? Or, uh, you want me to go? Go sure. Yeah. Okay. I began doing research at the National Archives in the early 1980s, so I haven't been at it quite as long as Margot Anderson. Um, but like her, I was somewhat surprised to realize how relatively young the archive is. And um, to learn that it's only 75 years old was quite a surprise to me because when I got here in the early 1980s, it seemed like it had been here forever. <coughs> and in fact, on my very first day, I came in January. It was a very cold January day, and I was all set to do research, and that was when the diplomatic records were held on site here, and I was buried in the stack somewhere on the sixth level. I never could get straight exactly what level I was supposed to be on, but apparently some pipes froze, and they kicked us all out. And so then I had to spend the rest of the day touring Washington. It was, there was a snowstorm and everything else. But I have done research at the central site here, at the other sites around Washington, but mostly at the presidential libraries. And I want to say something about presidential libraries and how they fit, at least how they fit to me as a consumer of what the National Archives and Record Administration does. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm H.W. Brand. Okay. Um, I've done research in presidential libraries uh, starting with the Franklin Roosevelt Library and extending to the, the first Bush Library in College Station. So I've gotten a, a pretty good idea of how these things work. And in the course of doing that research and discussing research in presidential libraries with my historical colleagues, we raised some questions about the advisability of farming records of presidential administrations out to different sites around the country. And we, I think, conclude that there are advantages and disadvantages. The largest disadvantage, I say there are two disadvantages primarily. One is logistical, and that is if you're a researcher, you've got to get to places like Abilene, Kansas, to do research, for example, on the Eisenhower administration. And that's simply an inconvenience for researchers. If, as is done in many other countries, the records were held centrally, and the obvious place would be in Washington, then you could come to Washington and do all your research. The disadvantage in terms of sort of the intellectual conceptualization of projects is because of the, the logistical difficulties, because of the travel involved, it encourages people doing research to think in terms of presidential administrations. Sometimes to conceive projects in terms of a presidential administration makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. And if you have a topic that spans three or four administrations, it is, well, you're, you're pushed in the direction of, no, let's just work on one administration or at most two, knowing that you'd have to travel to three or four different locations. Now, that's the downside of it. And since we're at 75 years old and maybe looking ahead for the next 75 years, I just wonder if this model is sustainable. So I'm not sure exactly how many presidential libraries there are at the moment, but in another 75 years, presumably there will be twice as many. And can the government simply sustain supporting, who knows, 25, 30, will there eventually be 50 presidential libraries? Okay, having said that, I'm gonna share a couple of personal experiences. When you do research in places like Abilene, Kansas, you get personal treatment that at least I've never received in Washington. Now, I don't want to cast any aspersions on the expertise or the professionalism of the folks in the archives here in Washington. But I, for my first visit to Abilene, this was back in the days before email, and I wrote a letter to the director of the, the Eisenhower Library. And I said that I was going to be coming up. This, I wrote this letter long before I was going to get there. So I wrote the letter in October. And I said that I was going to be doing research in March during my spring break. So they said, fine, come on, we'll be happy to see you. And I really didn't think any more of it. And I didn't make any follow-up. I arrived on a, late on a Sunday night in March at the beginning of spring break. It happened to snow overnight. I had driven up from Texas to Abilene, Kansas. It happened to snow overnight. And as I said, I hadn't told anybody at the library that to confirm that I was coming. I hadn't said certainly where I was going to be. 
But at quarter to eight in the morning, I got a call in my motel. And it was somebody who worked at the Eisenhower Library asking if in light of the snow, I'd need a ride to the library. <laughs> and, and at first I thought, well, gee, this is great. They're really polite here. And then I wondered, well, how did you find me? <laughs> Until I realized there are only two of motels in Abilene. <laughs> and uh, they, may, they probably had already called the other one. But there's another thing that happens when you're at a place, well, in a town like Abilene, you very quickly get to know who the other researchers are. Because at any given time, at least when I was there on this visit in the 80s, there were maybe three or four other people in the research room. And so at coffee breaks, at lunch, you get to know each other people and you get to find out who's working on what. And some of my oldest professional friendships date from those days. And also some clues as to exactly how you're supposed to go about this business. I was a graduate student at the time, and I assumed that the idea of research was to go and find out everything there is to know about the subject. And then on the basis of that, you piece together the story. And maybe, maybe Michael Dobbs still does. But um, I, I remember um, speaking to, I, I won't name this individual because he might be embarrassed for me to, to share this particular <coughs> experience. But he is a very distinguished diplomatic and international historian. And I'll tip my hand a little bit more. He's based in the Washington area. So we were out there, and the, the, the library in, in Abilene was, I mean, like a lot of archives, it was, it's kept pretty cold. And so we had, to, we, got, we had to go to the cafeteria to warm up. And so I was asking him what he was working on. I didn't know who he was. When he mentioned, when he told me his name, then I recognized, because I'd read some of his books. And I said, so what are you coming here? You, you doing some uh, ground, you know, early research for this project that you're working on? Because he had told me what the project was. And, and what he said was, he said, no. He said, I've already written a book. I've just come here to find some footnotes. And, and I, I said, well, isn't that kind of doing it backwards? Aren't you supposed to do the research first and then find the, and, and then write the book? He said, it works a lot faster this way. <laughs> One last thing. One last thing. I live in Austin. And I've been using the Johnson Library in Austin for years and years. And for those of us who have studied Lyndon Johnson, one of the hardest things in doing research at the Johnson Library, or in fact anywhere else, on the subject of Lyndon Johnson until about 10 years ago, was trying to find Lyndon Johnson at his own library because Lyndon Johnson did, none, did not commit himself to paper, unlike Dwight Eisenhower, for example, who dictated diary entries every day. And so you've got this Ann Whitman diary, and you, Eisenhower is talking this, 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 and this. At the Johnson Library, there was no record, almost no record of Lyndon Johnson. Memos would go into the Oval Office, and Johnson had this system where at his aides were trained that at the end of a memo, there would be three boxes. Box one is, I approve. Box two is, I disapprove. And box three is, I need more information. And all you'd get was this script L for Lyndon in one of those boxes. And occasionally, a very cryptic comment that you'd have to try to decipher. And this was, this was the puzzle for all of us who were trying to study Lyndon Johnson. Where's Johnson in his own library? Well. In about 1999 or 2000, the then director of the Johnson Presidential Library, Harry Middleton, who had a connection to the Johnson administration, he'd worked for Lyndon Johnson, was about to retire. And Harry Middleton knew something that he couldn't tell anybody else, that he hadn't told anybody else. And that is that Lyndon Johnson had tape recorded his telephone conversation. Now, those of us who studied Johnson knew that Johnson worked on the telephone. And this is why we were muttering under our breath all the time. He didn't write stuff down. He worked the phone. But as far as we knew, there was no record. Well, there was a record. And the record was supposed to be sealed for 50 years after Johnson's death. He died in 1973. Well, Harry was, he was retiring. And he decided that he ought to, as a gift to historical researchers, 
talked to Lady Bird Johnson, who was the only one who could essentially break the will and open the record. And Harry did. And as his sort of parting gift to the historical community, Harry Middleton made available what now is this invaluable record of Lyndon Johnson. These are the, the tape-recorded con telephone conversations. Now they're transcripts. And they're also available. You can listen to them on the internet. Now, I suspect that that's something that could happen at a presidential library in a particular city where there's this direct connection between the director of the library and the heirs of the president. I have a hunch it wouldn't work so easily in Washington. So there might be arguments for amalgamating the presidential libraries, but that's at least one for keeping them separate. Thank you. I'm Don Ritchie from the Senate Historical Office, and I actually can date myself by saying when I arrived at the National Archives as a researcher, it was 33 years old. Uh, so uh, that was a long time ago. But I was doing uh, my doctoral research, and I was working for about a man who uh, headed three different executive agencies and worked for three different presidential administrations. So like Bill, I traveled around the country seeing what, uh, what uh, places like Independence, Missouri, and, and Hyde Park, New York, and uh, Boston, and later on several other presidential uh, libraries. But my life changed in 1976 when I went to work for the U.S. Senate in the Senate Historical Office. And when I got there, I discovered that the U.S. Senate had no access rules for its records here at the National Archives. It donates its uh, rec records to the archives, but actually continues to own them because, of course, this is an executive branch and we have separation of powers. And none of the Congress had never gotten around to deciding how this record should open. They had also exempted themselves, wisely, I think, from the Freedom of Information Act. So <laughs> there was no you know, <laughs> recognition for, uh, for researchers on how to get to do this, except to throw themselves on the mercy of the chairman of the committees that still had control over those records. And so for about four years, from 1976 to 1980, I came down to the archives almost on a weekly basis, looking up uh, records to see whether or not a committee could safely open those materials. Well, it was eye-opening. I suddenly discovered that Congress investigates everything. Congress looks into everything. Congress debates everything. Whatever your subject of research is, if you just go to the executive branch, you haven't seen it all because the legislative branches had a say in it as well. They, in, way back in the 19th century, they were looking into railroad in the West or so. Uh, in the 20th century, they were looking into juvenile delinquency as an issue. I had a researcher who wanted to see the records of the Senate Juvenile Delinquency Subcommittee. So I came here, I opened up the boxes, and I found Mad Magazine and Tales from the Crypt <laughs> and the scripts for Route 66 and the Twilight Zone. It was like my childhood all over again. <laughs> I was, was having a wonderful time. And I could see, I was sitting in the reading room and other researchers looking over and wondering <laughs> why I was reading Tales from the Crypt, which we did open up and a book came out of that uh, professor's research. Uh, I did research on a man named uh, Bernstein, whose a son was, an, uh, was a reporter for the Washington Post named Carl. And Carl Bernstein was writing about his parents, who had been possibly, probably, members of the Communist Party in the 1940s, and uh, who were investigated by the FBI constantly, and who uh, were also investigated by the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee. Senator Kennedy was then chairing the Judiciary Committee. He thought it was a good idea to look at these records. I went through, uh, recommended that they be opened up. Uh, and wrote a letter uh, suggesting that it was okay because this was the son of the person. And he, actually, Carl Bernstein mentioned this letter in the introduction to his book, saying, of course I should be able to look at these, re these records. But of course, there was no mechanism for doing this. Now, in uh, 1980, uh, Dick Baker, who's the head of the Senate Historical Office, drafted the first resolution for access to Senate records. And Senator Robert C. Byrd, who was getting involved in a big history project that was going to take him through most of the 1980s, thought this was a very good idea and introduced it. And since he was the majority leader at the time, that had a very good chance of getting passed. And in fact, the US Senate in 1980 set a rule of 20 years for automatically opening almost all of their records, except for records that dealt with personal privacy, national security, or investigations, which could be kept closed as long as 50 years. 
As it happened, one of the researchers was a professor at the City College of New York who wanted to see the unpublished records of Joseph McCarthy, the unpublished hearings of McCarthy. And this was in the period when I was still coming down to look at those records, around 1980. And uh, we discovered that the year before Senator McCarthy took over his committee, the sub special subcommittee on investigations of the Senate, the committee had held six closed hearings. The year that Senator McCarthy took over, the committee held 130 closed hearings. And in fact, over the two years that he was chairman, they held 160 closed hearings. And I started looking through these. Of course, uh, I was curious as to what was in there. And there was the testimony of Langston Hughes and uh, Dashiell Hammett and, and all sorts of people, some of whom I knew and some of whom I didn't. And it was Roy Cohen was asking questions. And Joe, uh, Senator McCarthy was intervening. It was fascinating stuff. So we recommended to the permanent subcommittee that they open those records. And that we, uh, in fact, we suggested we could even publish them for them. As this was 1980, it turned out there were still several senators on the committee who had served with Senator McCarthy. There were still some staff members who had been there. They all said, you can't open those records. Are you crazy? Uh, first off, a lot of those witnesses are still alive. Many of them never testified in public hearing. You'd be dragging them through the mud all over again. You know, that's way behind us. That's history, they said. We, you can't open that up. Uh, and they uh, took advantage of this new resolution and said, those records should be closed for 50 years. OK, you win some and you lose some. But time passes. And pretty soon, it seemed very soon, uh, the year 2003 was approaching, which we realized was the 50th anniversary of when Joe McCarthy began to hold those hearings. So we went to the committee, which fortunately for us at that time was chaired by Senator Susan Collins of Maine, who saw herself as a political descendant of Margaret Chase Smith, one of the very few senators who had the nerve to stand up to Senator McCarthy. And we told her what we wanted to do. We wanted to publish uh, those materials and uh, get them out so that researchers wouldn't have to all come to Washington to see them. And um, she agreed, and we did this. Uh, that was the, the Congress that was divided 50-50. And you may remember about halfway through that year, Senator Jeffords got up from one side of the aisle and went to the other side of the aisle, and suddenly Senator Carl Levin was the chairman of that committee. So by the time we finished it, we kind of hoped that Senator Levin thought the way Senator uh, Collins did. And we went to him with a little trepidation saying, we have 160 hearings by Joe McCarthy that we have now edited for publication. It's going to be at five volumes. Uh, can we open this up? And Senator Levin said, you know, when I was in college, I got a petition drive to get Senator McCarthy censured. And I took that petition to Senator James Henderson Duff of Pennsylvania. I have a photograph of myself handing the petition to him. I'd love to see these volumes come out. <laughs> so we had bipartisan support for this project when it came out. It went online uh, in, uh, in the spring of 2003. Yeah, and the internet site where it was posted crashed because so many people <laughs> tried to look at it. In fact, we had a telephone call from uh, Scotland, from a researcher who was very upset that he couldn't get the access to this, this record. It's begin when we began to realize the power of the internet and, and who was using this. Uh, so those records went out. And they're a little bit of a <coughs> story to say that uh, you don't know what's in the archives. There's a mountain of stuff that hasn't been looked at yet, especially in the legislative <laughs> branch records. Because so many people have gone to the executive branch and just not looked at the legislative materials. But anything you're interested in researching probably has a legislative component. Uh, it's in this building as opposed to archives too, and is waiting there for you to do your research. And I'm, this was just one project of many. In fact, there are all the support materials, all the files relating to the uh, McCarthy investigations, which we didn't include, we didn't have room for, uh, that are sitting there for some other researcher to come to make use of. Uh, and uh, uh, for me, it was a terrific experience. It was just an accident of employment and timing. Uh, but I'm now happy to say that because we have the, the resolution that was adopted in 1980, I almost never have to come down to the National Archives to do that kind of work because it opens up automatically. And you've got a great staff of people here who are, are ready to uh, assist in doing research in legislative records. Thank you. Well, my name is Megan Smolniak, and I'm here today wearing two hats. I'm the chief family historian for Ancestry.com, and I'm also a longtime, in fact, I have to say almost lifelong genealogist. Just out of curiosity, are there any other genealogists here? Yeah, we got, I thought we'd be represented in the audience today, yeah. 
Um, I'm one of those ones, I started in the sixth grade as a result of a homework assignment. And I remember very well in high school, I happened to live in suburban Maryland at the time, all my other classmates, they couldn't wait till they turned 16 because they wanted to get their driver's licenses. I also couldn't wait till I turned 16, but it was because I was counting down the days until I could come and research at the National Archives. I don't know what the rules are now, but at the time you had to be 16 to come here and research independently. And so that started my life of one of my parents dropping me off. I would go up to room 400, be one of the first ones to sign in. I would scroll my arm off all day. I was one of those who believed that bathroom breaks were for sissies. <laughs> I probably still am one of those today. Uh, and it was fun because it was, it was such the early days that many of the records weren't even yet in what was 400 at the time. For example, if you wanted to go explore passport ap applications, you got taken off to one of these other floors with the low ceilings, and it felt very exotic, and it sort of like time travel. I just loved it, every moment of it. I am still, fast forward all these years later, addicted. Um, I should also give a shout out to the National Archives for helping me work my way through school, because I did my undergrad at Georgetown, one of my masters at GW, and I got into the whole record retrieval business, coming here, pulling, say, copies of people's Civil War pension files, and that kind of thing. And then fortunately over the last decade or so, I've had the opportunity to make genealogy my full-time life. So now as I do research here, it tends to be more media driven. It's usually at the behest of uh, a journalist or say working on a TV show, that kind of thing. Um, but I am an addict for the National Archives. I'm glad it's been here for the whole of my life and I hope it'll be here for many, many, many more generations of Smolniaks to come. Now putting on my ancestry hat for a moment, I have to just say that I'm delighted at the partnership um, and with regards to the digitization of the records. Because to me, I regard this as sort of a form of insurance for our nation's history. You look at just what's happened this year in Italy where one of the state archives went down in an earthquake. And geez, I think it wasn't even a month later in Cologne in Germany where an archives just collapsed. If you're a genealogist and you read the list, you see with almost horrific regularity notes about this or that library or archive or historical society getting hit by a flood or a hurricane or whatever it is. So to me, this is just a massive national insurance policy to get as many records digitized as quickly as possible. Having said that, I don't know if any of you all saw the New York Times article a few months ago where it was guesstimated that at the current pace, which is quite ambitious, we're still looking at another 1,800 years to digitize just the text collections here at the National Archives. Now, of course, technology will catch up, that rate will accelerate and so forth, but as far as I'm concerned, we can't do enough quickly enough and uh, I'm delighted to live at the point in time when you can have the luxury of searching some of your records sitting at home in your PJs at two in the morning, but that will never do away for the need to come to the physical repositories to see the other records, because what's online will always just be a tip of the iceberg, and of course to consult with the experts. Thank you. We have microphones on either side. Are there questions from the audience? <laughs> no, because, because we are recording this for presentation later, we need you to go to the microphone so that your question gets recorded as well. Well, okay, here we go. Uh, thank you very much. I've been fascinated with your stories. Um, I, as a healthcare researcher, I'm a user of data that is published by the federal government through the census, mostly through the census and through uh, special studies done in the health department. And one of my beefs has been that um, politics has intervened at various times. And I'd love to have your comments on this. For example, during the uh, Nixon administration, when I was looking at uh, statistical abstracts of the United States, they changed the category so that they weren't comparable for one year to the next. And during the Reagan administration, they just stopped publishing in 1978 any data that was useful to us. And I'd like to know if there's some way we could get a steady stream of data that was consistent from one year to the other so we could find it useful. Thank you. Uh, that's a common um, concern um, The with, uh, here we're not talking about archival materials, we're talking about um, published information from, 
yeah, or census data from the federal statistical system. Uh, all statistical data is what I used, I always call Janus faced. In other words, it has to look backwards and forwards. So it, it, it there's always a tension of trying to maintain continuity with old um, uh, provisions and yet innovating for new needs. What tends to happen in that situation is that the budget is fixed first. So something new has to displace something old. Okay, that's the first issue. The second issue that you see emerging is embarrassment, which I think is where you're going with this, over the implications of a certain uh, kind of publication and um, of information. For example, um, I think in the early years of the Reagan administration, for example, the, the series that the Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, routinely published on strikes was discontinued. Strikes disappeared from the United States because we just because the government stopped recording when they were happening. That issue is one that has to be taken up as a policy matter, and essentially the the um, you need to go to your congressman and senator and the agency and squawk and sort of talk about it. Uh, uh, much of my research in in, in the, the history of the federal statistical system is aimed at 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 revealing how that works. If you know, if, if we know how the Cuban Missile Crisis works, we also need to know how these very um, what seem to be mundane decisions get made, and that's what I you know, that's what where the records are absolutely essential because somebody has talked about that. Any other comments on the the way information is or is not available as a function of? Administration, or well, I'm shocked, shocked that there's any politics involved. In <laughs> I'd like to add something, and that is that um, in my research on various presidents and their administrations, I occasionally run across somebody who seems to be looking over. It's usually his shoulder toward historians like me, who are going to be looking at this record 30 or 40 or 50 years later. But they're the real exceptions. And one of the things that I discovered pretty quickly is the people who are making these decisions, who are writing these memos, are so consumed with what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis that they have no concern whatsoever for what it's going to look like 50 years later. Now, that has an advantage in that it means, for the most part, what they put down is what they're candidly thinking. But the disadvantage can be that they don't lay this stuff out in convenient form for me to research later on. Um, there's an example, again, from the Johnson Library that shows how sometimes this is, is shifted and how it can work in the historian's favor. At the end of the Johnson administration, Lyndon Johnson gave orders to the folks in his administration to start pulling materials together to write a history of the administration. It was going to be, I think, originally a history of the National Security Council during his administration. And they never got around to publishing it. But they, the folks who were working on the files, they really did all of a sudden have this eye to history. And I think this has a lot to do with the fact that Johnson left office under a very dark cloud and believed, I'm pretty sure until the day he died in 1973, that the more that people knew about the internal workings of his administration, the more they would come to see that things weren't as bad as they appeared in 1968 when he dropped out of the presidential race. He was one who really believed sincerely in getting the record out there as quickly as possible. The result was that there is this, uh, there's a small collection that's called the NSC History File. And it was something that was put together for this history of the National Security Council, with the result that the researcher who goes in there and is researching one of the topics that the, the Johnson folks thought were important feels as though he's died and gone to heaven because materials have been pulled from all over the place and packed in these just few boxes. So I remember writing whole chapters of a book that I did on the Johnson administration's foreign policy from just a few of these boxes. I almost got embarrassed because every footnote <laughs> referred to the same box, but there it was. Somebody had done my work for me. It's not usually that convenient.